our next speaker, our, our closing speaker, is a leading economics in, sorry, a leading economist, excuse me, uh, and energy expert. He goes by the name of Jeff Rubin. Uh, whenever he speaks, people listen, especially when he's paying the bill or he's holding a baseball bat, because that, like, they'll get your attention. Uh, a chief economist at CIBC World Markets for nearly 20 years, he's one of the first economists to accurately predict the, the rising oil prices in 2000. Uh, Rubin is considered uh, one of the world's leading energy experts, and his latest book, or his latest best-selling best -selling book, excuse me, uh, The End of Growth, But Is It All That Bad, argues that the end of cheap oil means dwindling oil supplies for the future, but it could lead to the emergence of local economies and stimulate a North American economy as well as help the world's climate change program, which I think we used to just call global warming. Now it's climate change. It's global warming. And I'll take it in January because it's friggin' cold here. Um, <clears throat> Ruben pe uh, penned the best-selling 2009 book, uh, Why Your World is About to Get a Whole Lot Smaller, Oil and the End of Globalization, and that book won him the Canadian Business Book of the Year Award. Please join me in welcoming our closing speaker, Jeff Rubin. Hi. You know, back in 1973, after the first OPEC oil shock, President Nixon, the president of the time, implemented what was called the Emergency Energy Conservation Act, where he lowered the speed of highway speeds on interstate highways, much to the chagrin of U.S. motorists, to 55 miles an hour. And conservation measures like that were pretty well adopted throughout the driving world at the time. But when you change the price of oil as dramatically as we've seen over the last decade, a five-fold increase, you don't just change the speed at which you drive your car, you change the speed at which your economy can grow. If we know anything about the performance of the global economy over the last four decades, we know this. Feed it cheap oil, and it runs like a charm. But all of a sudden, ration it expensive fuel, and the engine of growth seizes up, literally, overnight. We've been, of course, trying to wean ourselves off that magic fuel ever since the first OPEC oil shock. And in many respects, we've been successful. When I was growing up in Toronto, my parents' home had an oil fire furnace, as did most furnaces in North America. We've now substituted much cheaper natural gas for oil as a source of home heating. And very few places in the world other than the Middle East would burn oil to generate electric power. Again, we've substituted natural gas. And we can certainly substitute much cheaper natural gas for oil as a feedstock for making petrochemicals. But unfortunately, the demand for oil is growing not because of its role as a home heating source, a source of power generation, or a feedstock for petrochemicals, but rather as a transit fuel. And for that application, oil has no economic substitute. No matter how you move goods around the world, whether you move them by air, by boat, by rail, or by truck, you're burning one fuel and one fuel only, and that fuel is oil. And that's because of the amount of energy density that it has, which is about four times that of natural gas. And of course, it is that continuing dependence on oil that makes it so critical to the performance of our economy. Looking back in the last four decades, every major global recession has had oil's fingerprints all over it. 1973, the first OPEC oil shock led to what was at the time the deepest recession in the post-war period. Six years later, the Iranian Revolution, the second OPEC oil shock, led to not one, but two recessions, the now infamous double dip. And of course, in 1991, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and left half of its oil fields on fire, and oil spiked to the then unheard of price of $40 a barrel, lo and behold, once again, the major oil-consuming economies of the world, North America, Western Europe, Japan, rolled over into recession. 
and certainly last, but by no means least, the recent recession, of which we've barely recovered, followed on the heels of $147 a barrel oil. Of course, that's not the way that most people see the last recession. Most economists, most financial market pundits would tell you that wasn't an energy shock. That was a financial accident who had its roots in the now failed U.S. subprime mortgage market. Well, no one has to remind me how devastating the subprime mortgage market was on financial institutions. Why the hell do you think I'm an author now? 